Welcome to an episode of Be The Change podcast. This is a, a raw podcast. This is all about how people within our province of Newfoundland and Labrador and all over are being the change. Welcome, Laura Mba is a communications, marketing, and fun development specialist and a mom to a four-year-old boy. She recognizes and has lived experiences of the disparities in society for BIPOC, marginalized, and underrepresented communities. She lends her voice and leverages her experiences to bring their concerns and struggles to the decision-making table. She's one of the hosts of Rogers Out of the Fog show. Exciting. Laura Bell enjoys shining light on those working hard and smart to make Newfoundland and Labrador a more welcoming province, as well as those striving to improve the lives of all who call it home. As a member of the Anti-Racist Coalition of Newfoundland and Labrador, a member of both the St. John's Status of Women Council and Happy City of St. John's, she works with a wide variety of mind, like-minded individuals to improve the experiences of marginalized communities in our province. Her activism spirit becomes public after the murder of George Floyd. The unfortunate incident inspired her to write a series of poems focused on the Black experience and fighting racism and prejudice. Laura Bell Umba is, uh, sorry, like that, that you, you have a fantastic name, by the way. Be before we started this, you told me how to pronunciate it. And no Umba, okay, we're, we're getting it right, uh, is involved in numerous campaigns focused on advocacy on issues about 2S LGBTQ plus representation, inclusion and diversity in politics and mental health. As a founder of Race to Dinner and L Chapter, she actively uh confronts racism and white supremacy and empowers white allies to be powerful advocates. Wow, that <laughs> is amazing. Truly, you're doing a lot. Just a smidgen. You are. You're, you're doing more than most. Um, <laughs> you, you're like, I want to be completely educated. Let's have a, a raw conversation about you as a person. Let's start there. Tell me how your, how did you form? Like, like your advocacy, where did that come from? So that one's a really interesting one for me to talk about because I think on some level I've always kind of been an advocate, um, whether it was something as little as when I lived in residence, it was the first year, first years were allowed to live in Burton's Pond officially, publicly, mm -hmm. and we didn't really have an executive council. And I was like, we need one if we're going to be first years, we deserve a right to have the same first year experience <laughs> as the people living on Peyton College. And so it was being part of that. But I guess the advocacy that people see today when it comes to anti-racism and all of that came more to light after my son was born. So after my son was born in 2019, and then that was all fun, hunky-dory. And then we moved into 2020, and then we had the murder of George Floyd. And then it became a thing for me. So like when I was pregnant, a lot of people were like, oh, you must be excited. You must be really pumped. And there was a part of me was like, yeah, I'm, I'm excited to be a mom. I'm nervous to be a mom to a Black boy. And he's biracial, but for as far as the world's concerned, he's going to be a young Black man. And he's going to be a Black man in a society not currently built for Black men. So that was when activism became a real thing for me because my parents have given me the talk. I've seen them give the talk to my brothers. I want this to be the last generation of children that have to have that talk. Mm -hmm. so, that's kind of what <laughs> pushed yeah. the activism forefront for me yeah so um a, a question where did you grow up to sounds like you're educated you grew up here in newfoundland and labrador I grew up a lot of places. No, okay. so <laughs> I'm very weirdly world, not world travel, but global. Um, I was born in Nigeria okay. and my family moved to Canada when I was eight. So that was early 2000. And then I grew up between Toronto, moved to Alberta for my last year of high school and my gap year, and then came here for university. Oh, wow. And I've been here ever since. Yeah. So Newfoundland, uh, I guess, according to um, some journalists, has been called the most friendliest place to live. Uh, and I know that's a whole lot of unpackaging. Um, I, I love Newfoundland and Labrador. This is my home. This is where I was born to in Ghouls, um, subsection of, you know, St. John's. It was a small farming community when I grew up. But 
working in healthcare, I didn't always see it, to be honest, as welcoming as probably what it should be. And I'm sure, um, and I'm a white, queer, cisgender settler. Um, that's my intersectionalities. And from your perspective as being a Black woman, you know, what has that been like for you? Um, so I'm going to preface anything I say with, I do love you tonight. I'm not going to let the what I say be like, oh, she doesn't like it. I love it here. I'm yeah. raising a family here. This is where I've chosen to settle. So I want that to be understood. And I think Newfoundland has this welcoming sense to it, yes. But there seems to be, I'm going to call it a fear hmm. of people love showing off all that this province has to offer, the kindness, the culture, the experiences when people are visiting. But it seems like if anyone who doesn't fit what someone would assume a Newfoundlander and Labradorian looks like right. is coming to settle, there's a belief or fear that we're going to change the culture and it will no longer be quote unquote Newfoundland and Labrador. Right. And so there's this disparity of, yes, come visit. Wait, are you staying? What does you <laughs> staying mean? What do you want? What do you need? Mm -hmm. Why are you staying? And right. that's where if you don't already have a community that you know and love here, you don't feel like you should stay. You don't feel like you have the right to stay and make this home unless you work really, really hard to find a community and build a community that reminds you of all the things you fell in love when you visited. Right. And that's, that's really unfortunate. And, and I wonder if Newfoundlanders and Labradorians know how much they're excluding people. I don't know if they do, because I think it comes from a place of when Newfoundlanders and Labradorians go away, they don't feel like they fit in. And I know there's been a long standing history between the rest of Canada and Newfoundland and Labrador, mm -hmm. where the rest of the Canada said you didn't fit in. Right. You aren't one of us and you don't belong. And them being the last province to join the Federation probably exacerbated that. So when people come here, there's still this Newfoundland for Newfoundlanders you're from away and like come from away is a wonderful mm -hmm. term to show how you relate to the province but some for some people that stems really deep as in you aren't from here you will never be from here regardless of how many generations of you are from here because you don't fit the image of what we thought mm -hmm. and because we've been excluded we don't always know how to find ourselves in other places so this is the one place that we've had for us and we're afraid that if we change it it won't be for us anymore and I think that's how I explain it to myself because I don't want to go on a belief system of no they don't like us whoever us is right. but more of they haven't been given the opportunity where they were welcomed for long term in other places so this is mm -hmm. the one place they've had for themselves so they're fighting to keep their identity and fear of change and losing their identity and that's the way my brain tries to make it work out yeah and that's I think that's a great perspective actually I've I've had this conversation many times with people on why is it we are the way that we are, um, trying to get an understanding, just a curious understanding of, um, I say the same thing, you know, come for a holiday, we love you, but, but when are you going home, right? Yeah. So it's, it's, it's that sort of a feeling, which I think is, is awful to people who aren't white, like, like that honest race conversation that um, growing up, I had very few friends that weren't white. Um, you know, we were, uh, I had one friend who was, um, Asian and that was it. Um, and, and, you know, I think through the university, through, uh, different backgrounds, I mean, we're starting to become, uh, have more races, have more perspectives, have more, um, just people from different cultures and backgrounds and richnesses and ethnicities. Like, I think it's absolutely fantastic. I, you know, this is my passion, like talking about diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging. Yeah. That the whole B piece. So if you don't feel like you belong, you're not going to stay. You're yeah. not going to contribute. You're not going to add. Um, so I think it's about adding to our culture and richness in Newfoundlander and Labradorians. So getting people to stay here and be here and to be a part of that. Um, exactly. You know, what, whatever that is, you know, and I, I'm hoping that, like you said, generations to come, that your son and his his children, you know, we don't have to have this race conversation and it doesn't have to be like that. Um, you know, people say to me, like, why, why do you want to have these conversations? And I said, because not everyone is, and we need yeah. to shed perspective on it. So what's your take on that? Like, I guess race to dinner is all about 
perspectives at all, giving yeah. giving white women, uh, gender diverse folks perspectives on race. So, so the idea of race to dinner actually started in the U.S. So okay. it was started by Saria Rao and Regina Jackson, who are two women, and Saria is of Indian descent and Regina is Black. And they started it because they needed to have these conversations, these conversations meetings we had, and they were having it solely with white women. And so I happened to watch the Deconstructing Karen documentary on CBC Gem. And um, I tell the story every time I talk about why race to dinner. I was sitting in bed, my son was asleep with me and I was watching the documentary and I was like, okay, I'm not, these experiences that I've had are real. There are other people who have had these experiences and they're having these conversations. So I watched the entire CBC documentary and like pulled up my tablet and I was like, race to dinner, found it. I emailed them and my first thing was like, I know this is what you do there. And it's great there. But if you've ever thought about training people to be able to facilitate these conversations elsewhere, let me, if you aren't sure, let me be the test ground. I don't even care, but I need to be part of this because I want a way to do this in my community. Because when someone calls me my love, I want that love to be real. Yeah. I want it to be more than just something you say, like, hey. Mm -hmm. So let me have these conversations so that the people who say my love or my ducky understand that I'm part of them. Yes. I'm one of them to some extent and they do feel a relation to me and I'm not just this person over there. Mm -hmm. So I did the training with them and it was enriching. It was sad on a point where there were so many other people who have had these experiences throughout the US, throughout Canada, we're like we need and we want to do these in our communities and then people always ask why white women or white gender diverse individuals and i was like it starts with white women because there's an untapped power in being a white woman that people don't realize mm -hmm. and that's because when you look at the order of patriarchy and white supremacy white men sit at the top they yes. are the ones with the gavel the ones who control mm -hmm. it all and then who comes next and people were like, I don't know. And I was like, that's where white women fall in. And white women fall not because they hold the gavel, but there's a common saying is the man is the head, the woman is the neck. The head looks where the neck turns. And if we want the head to do anything, the neck is where the power is. So white men, whether they do it because they want to, or it's just what's inbred into years and years of patriarchy and years and years of their existence, they will protect white women at every level, at every level in terms of when they are not the threat. When the threat is right. outside being a white man, a white man will always protect the white woman. And that is because a white woman is either his mother, a white woman is either his sister, his mm -hmm. aunt, his grandmother, but someone he sees a relation to before he'll ever see a relation to me before right. he see a relation to any other racialized person. So if we want the change to happen, it happens there because you guys are at those dinner tables. You're the ones who they see in spaces where they can be their most authentic, good or bad, mm -hmm. you're seeing it. And then if you say, hey, this makes me uncomfortable, that's going to mean more than if I say, hey, this makes me uncomfortable. And it might not be an instantaneous change, Mm -hmm. but in the back of their head, it's like, my mom didn't really like that. Or my sister, I didn't like that when happened to my sister. I didn't like that my sister felt that way. Someone I love and care about felt that way. And I didn't like it. So if one changes, that's one in a group of men who's going to tell other men. And you are more likely to get that man to change than I am. And then when we talk about gender diverse or the queer community, a lot of people who aren't in the queer community don't know the rampant racism that falls within the queer community. And that's heartbreaking as someone who is queer myself to see that. Because if we talk about, let's say, dating within the community, that's the only place you're openly going to see no Blacks, no Asians, no this on a dating profile with no hesitation in stating those things. And then we're sitting there like, you're already marginalized as a queer person. Why are you then going to double down on that <laughs> level of vitriol for someone else so if you're trying to change the whole basically cisgender straight heterosexual community you do it with white women 
And if you're trying to change the queer community, you do it with white queer people. And that's the two places where that have the power to change. If these two places come together for racialized folks, there is literally nothing white patriarchy can do because then we have a larger ground. We have all the racialized people standing together, all the queer community standing together, and all the white women standing together. And what is a white man going to say up against an army like that? <laughs> Self-preservation means you have to change. <laughs> and that's yeah. why race to dinner. And in starting it, I've gotten questions from white men being like, why not us? And I was like, if you're willing to have this conversation, I'm going to be willing to do it. Mm -hmm. But you have to understand you sit in a position of power. And so there needs to be a 50-50 split in the audience. Because not that I want to assume the worst of being in a room of all white men and me saying, you did wrong and you did me wrong this way. There's a tendency to either directly attack or belittle my experiences as a woman or as a racialized woman. And so if there's a 50-50 split, there's at least a sense of, oh, I'm not as on, at on attack. You can't fully attack me when you have others who are slightly different than you there. So that's why that's what, because of, it's a general, just a safety issue. You have the power and I cannot yes. fully walk into a situation where I have no power other than my lived experience and expect you to change for me. So it is something that we are moving towards having with the 50-50 split, but I don't think we're in a position as a society yet where race to dinner, even on Labrador, will ever happen with a dinner table with 10 white men, just because we're not yeah. there for that conversation no. yet. Yeah. Creating safe spaces is so important when we're having conversations in general, let alone conversations that these are big. Um, these are ones where we're, you know, people are going to be shouted out on biases, yes. on racism, homophobia. They're going to be shouted out on things that, because, you know, we all have them, you know, yeah. they're unconscious or conscious. Like we all have pieces of these. Um, we all have microaggressions that we've experienced from different intersectionalities that we live, whether that's your black, your queer, your Asian, it, there's, you know, disability, indigenous, yeah. you know, from, from our lived experiences, you know, whatever that intersectionality is and um, highlighting. Um, some of those things is important for people to understand your lived experience, my lived experience, and how do we how do we do better? Like make your society, Newfoundland and Labrador, our culture. How do we shape that to make it the, going forward the best it can be? Exactly. Right? So um, I can see why you would you would do race to dinner for for gender diverse and for white women because I think you get different perspectives. Um, we know that ninety eight percent of companies are white cisgender males. They're the heads yeah. of them. Um, it's interesting when you were saying, you know, when it comes, you know, who would be the heads? I knew it was white males. Um, for some reason, I didn't think it would be white females. I don't know why. I just not. I, I was. I was just it's waiting. Weird. To see. Yeah. Yes. It, it's like they are women who lead companies. Unfortunately, we don't have as many women who are the head of companies, mm -hmm. and then so that falls into a feminist issue, and then that's a whole <laughs> different ballpark yeah. of things we have to do with. And then when people talk about the feminist movement, and there's like. It's not as inclusive as we would want it to be. We talk about feminism. There's a lack there in the feminist movement of understanding of the racialized experience and the fact that when you're fighting for equity and equal rights as a woman, like if we talk just voting rights, white women got the right to vote years before racialized women got the right to vote. Yes. But it seemed the minute white women got the right to vote, the push for voting voter rights took a dip. It was no longer on the plate of white women to fight for everyone to get the right mm -hmm. to vote because they were no longer an issue. Yeah. So that's, it seems that there are many intersectionalities of disadvantage, but if you get this one group, this core group to understand how they have the ability to empower everyone else, that's where we can finally begin to see things work. Right. So as a white queer woman, any takeaways for me? Any things that I can do that I may not be aware of right now or anyone that's listening or, or, or watching this, anything that we as white, queer, or white women in general can do? I think the first thing is to educate yourselves on what you don't know and the fact. So like, 
I know white privilege for a lot of people is a very touchy term for people Mm -hmm. to sit with. Mm -hmm. But the easiest way I explain it is white privilege doesn't mean that you've had things handed to you. It just means your race is not a reason you haven't gotten something. Mm -hmm. And so when I talk to white women and white queer women or white women as a whole, queer or not queer, it's to educate yourselves on what you, the safety you've been granted for not being racialized. Because if you think of everything that has been taking event away from you, at another level of you would get even more taken away if you were mm-hmm. a different ethnicity. And then so educate yourselves in whether it's reading a book. Books are a great way. And then a funny um, term that's used in the activist society is Google is free. As in, <laughs> if you have a question, yeah, it's if you have racialized friends who are willing to share their experiences with you, great. When they want to share them, they will right. share them. Yes. But if you want to know, it's not to ask your racialized friend or say, mm-hmm. hey, can you tell me? Can you teach me? It's like the internet is free. If you can learn how to code by mm-hmm. yourself mm-hmm. on your computer, yeah. you can learn about the inequity that exists for racialized folks. So one, do the reading, take in the knowledge, because once you know, you can't unknow. Right. So the minute you know, you're able to look at society and be like, oh my goodness, look at all the ways this shows up. And then when it shows up, you're like, then it's in small spaces. We don't, grandiose things are great, but they're not always long lasting, but it's in the, when your friend makes that weird comment that you're sitting there, it's like, that makes me slightly uncomfortable. Mm. If someone else were here and you're like, how would you feel if someone racialized was there? Would you be like, oh, I can't believe you said that. If that would be your reaction, then you go to your friend and be like, hey, let's, let's break this down. Why did you say that? Why did you think it was okay? And let's look at that thought pattern. Or if you're dealing at work when you're like, my workspace looks very, very not diverse in right. any expanse of the world. It'd be like, why? What is the fear? Why? If it, they're like, oh, no one applied who happens to be racialized. I was like, okay, did you apply in, did you post this ad in networks where racialized people would see? Did you do enough to reach the people so that they had the ability to f- apply and that they felt comfortable to apply? Or does your organization show up in racialized communities are you present in those spaces if you're not maybe you should be and then you would interact with them so that they feel a connection and a willingness to want to work with you so it's first educate yourself so you understand what the racialized experience is and then in your circle of power don't just create spaces for people to be at the table but give them a voice and serve them a meal that fits them so that's right. like when I think about diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging, I like to think of it as a dinner. Mm-hmm. Diversity is inviting everyone to the dinner. Great. Everyone got an invitation. Mm-hmm. Inclusion is making sure they have a way to get to said dinner. Mm-hmm. And then you make sure you serve something that is one that they would want to eat. And then at the end of the day, you check in with them to say, did you have fun? And that breaks down the diversity, the equity, the inclusion, and the belonging. Because you want to make sure they enjoyed it. And if they didn't, they'll tell you how. So you make sure that the next time you do this, they feel a part of it. Right. So would you would you ask up front? I think if you do something and you like, let's say an event happens and you're like, yeah, this is a strangely, like, not strangely, because it's used to seeing white people are used to being in spaces where they see predominantly just white people. But if you're like, how come no one of any other ethnicity was here? Mm-hmm. You look at your crowd and like, did we do enough? And if you guys can honestly say, we advertised, we reached out, we contacted and no one came and then it will be okay to be like, go to someone in the community, go to a community organization be like, why didn't you feel like this was a space where you could be? Mm-hmm. And then at those points, then they will tell you. But before you ask, make sure you've done the work yes. to make it a space where they would not only feel comfortable coming, but want to feel like their voices and experiences and will be valued and taken into account in whatever decision is being made. Right. Yeah. And and I think that's, we don't always meet people where they're too. That's something that we we don't always do with people, right? We don't meet them where they're too. We don't know enough about them. We don't do our homework. We just want people to flat out educate us 
Okay, great. We've done that. Now look, look how good we are. <laughs> exactly. And that's the right? thing. I think people do it for, oh, I did good. And I was like, that's not why you're doing this. You're doing this because you know it's hurt someone else. You're not doing this for other allies to say, you're doing a great job being an ally or for racialized folks to say, you did it. I feel good about you. You're doing mm-hmm. this so that yeah. if this was me, I would want someone to do this for me. Yeah. I'd want someone to pick up. I want someone to speak out, speak up do those interrupters. Yes. Um, yeah. And and as advocates, you and I, I suggest we are that it's probably easier for us to do those things than sometimes other people, because I find some people feel that they don't have a voice as it is. Um, yeah. And then, and then to try to put, put on top of them, this other piece of, okay, you feel you don't have a voice. So imagine you were in this person's shoes, a Brene Brown sort of thing, put yeah. yourself in that person's shoes. How do you think they feel? I find sometimes people find that very difficult to make that shift because it's about it's, them. People are, exactly. people are self-centered, let's be honest, yes, right? It's, it's about absolutely. me and my needs and what I want. So to shift, people find that really difficult to do that it's shift. It's a very uncomfortable thing because I think yeah. in shifting, you're also forced to realize where you are. Like everyone has a certain level of privilege that exists within yeah, our lives. Absolutely. So it's very awkward yeah. to sit there and be like, I oh, I... Mm, I have this privilege and I haven't been using it to make things better for someone else. Mm -hmm. And no one likes to self critique. And then when you have to do that, and then I think once you get over having to critique yourself, then you're in a place to actually do something good for someone else. Once we stop thinking of what do people think of me versus this is a very uncomfortable situation for anyone else. And I don't want someone else to continue to feel uncomfortable in spaces that I thrive mm-hmm. kind of thing. Yeah. And I think that's great wisdom for those listening is that uncomfortable abilities, they're going to exist, but should exist to, to, to the, 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 I guess, to the amount that they are. Currently. Exactly. And the answer yeah. is no, they shouldn't. No. Right. People should be able to go to work, go to school, go to workplaces, hang out, go to the mall and not have that uncomfortability of people staring at them, looking at exactly. them, you know, othering them. Yes, exactly. I think the othering is it. Like no one wants to be othered. I don't mind if people celebrate what makes me different, but I don't want it to be like, this is this extraordinary thing that you're different. And that's where othering comes in. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Just to shift slightly. Um, I talk to people a lot about their strengths, about their, what are, like, what do you see your strengths, your, your abilities, your superpowers? Because like, we all have superpowers. We do. <gasps> like, we truly all have superpowers and we have kryptonites. Yes. So for you as an advocate, as a leader in mental health, as your race to dinners, uh, out of the fog, you as a person, what are your, what are your superpowers? Like, what does that look like for you? Um, so this is really fun because I've asked people, <laughs> so this isn't through internal reflection at all. This is basically calling my community and being like, guys, what am I good at? Because it's, <laughs> you have those days where you're like, I you want to phone a friend? Tanking. Basically, I've, there have been days where I felt like I was tanking at mm-hmm. everything and you need to call the people who know you the best. And I've called them. I was like, what am I good at? For it, just remind me again what I'm good at. Right. I think right. it's gotten to a point now that they've gotten it into my head enough that I'm good at having these awkward conversations. I'm good at awkward because I like I tend to think about it like growing up I was thought of like as the geek the nerd I hung out like my friends and I were reading anime <laughs> in hallways. <laughs> I wasn't a cheerleader. I wasn't a jock. I wasn't a straight A student. I was with the kids who were considered the outcasts with the weirdly colored jeans and the brightly colored hair reading strange Japanese comic books in an alley. (laughs) And that is where I found my community. Mm -hmm. So awkward is well-bred into me. So I'm good (laughs) at these awkward conversations because I know what it's like to be uncomfortable. So when I'm having to talk to people about things that are uncomfortable, I try to do it in a gentle way so it doesn't feel like an interrogation. Yes, we will talk openly and frankly, but I never want someone to leave feeling attacked. I want you to leave being like, maybe I could do better. And this is this person and I 
had a genuine conversation where they didn't see me for just my faults, but they saw my intention and were able to redirect on the best way to do it. So I think having really awkward conversations about really important things and breaking them down to a basic level, like the easiest way is like if I was trying to explain it to my son and make sure that he understood what I was trying to get out is what Mm -hmm. I want anyone talking to me. There's no air of, oh, I'm superior, I'm well-educated, I'm any of that. No, it's, I'm having a coffee with a friend and we're talking about something that's really important to me and I needed to make it important to them. So I think that's where my strength lies. Right, that's fantastic, I love it. And how about your kryptonite? What's one of those things you're just like, you're just like, oh, like count to 10, let me count to 10, hang on, and then I'll, then I'll, then I'll speak. Um, I think, and I've been trying really hard to work on it, is getting really emotional about things because I struggle with that because there's a tendency, there's this whole belief of self-critiquing and beating myself up about it when it comes to, like, there's this belief of the, the mad black woman. And I work really hard to be like, when I'm expressing my ideas, not to be angry. Because I remember growing up, people were like, you're really abrasive and you're really angry and you're really mean. And I was like, I'm really not. I'm just, you've hit the button. There's like, everyone has that one button where you hit with them and it's mm-hmm. like, everything mm-hmm. goes loose. And I yeah. work really hard to not let that button be hit because I lose I will lose myself. I will lose what the intention is if you hit that button and I'm no longer able to explain my ideas to people in a way that they will understand if I take it as an attack. So typically when things get to me and I feel like I'm about to lose it, it's a, I try to step away. And some people will be like, why are you stepping away? You're not dealing with it right now. It's like, if I deal with it right now, nothing good is going to come out of it. None of the intended goals are going to be reached. So let me take a minute, clue myself over, go to people who are safe for me to yell and scream and say all the angry things I'm feeling at this point in time <laughs> and going back. But then I also really suck at being a people pleaser. <laughs> so it's really, really hard <laughs> to say no to things because mm-hmm. I always try to look at it and be like, oh, there could be good that comes out of it. So I go and go and go. And so like, um, we're in February right now and it's Black History Month and I'm like mm-hmm. chock full on things I'm doing and I was talking to my brother the other day he's like so when's your break and I was like what break what are you talking about he's like <laughs> you're doing all this when are you going to take a break and like say good job you did it and mm-hmm. you and I was like I'll sleep in March chat with me in March I will take a nap <laughs> and we'll do it then so it's controlling my emotions to make sure that I don't lose people and feeling too much mm-hmm. and then knowing that it's okay to say no to things and it's okay not to make everyone happy and knowing that some of the things that I need to do for myself and maintaining my own mental health and just caring for myself to make sure I can care for the people who I need to care for being my son saying no and it's okay to say no and sometimes people will be upset but it's okay and that's it's real hard yeah. it is hard to say no isn't it as people we want to I think, especially as I find women, we, we, we are pleasers sometimes and we want to help and we want to fix, yes. we want to get things done, doers, um, and have we done enough? And then yeah. in, imposter syndrome. Oh, that's big. Oh, it's, oh, it, it's, it's real. It's so it is real. real. No matter it, it, who you are, it's she's, real. She's vicious. <laughs> she mm. is real vicious. Yeah. And yeah, like, one on this shoulder, one on this shoulder. It's, it's basically like, there. Yeah. And like you're yep. trying to find, it's like, do I do, have I done enough to prove my value? Mm-hmm. Have I done enough now that you think I'm valuable enough that if I decide, let me sit this one out, I don't fall to the bottom of the rung and I'm no longer of value to you, to society, yeah. to the places where I want to be valued. So, right. positive syndrome and doing too much of people, it's, it's a lovely combination. It is. It is. And I find a lot of us, um, it's, it's the struggle is real. And it's, uh, I think, a piece of the work that, that we do and come to terms with, was that good enough? Um, we're our own worst critics. And Absolutely. certainly, I think most women come across the imposter syndrome and it, and it hits us hard. It's like, do I know enough on this topic? Can I speak about it? 
what are people going to say? What are they going to think? How do I look? Like it's yes. it's all those things combined, Everything. right? It's yeah, it's it's massive. Absolutely, and like I try to think. So when I was talking to people about imposter syndrome, and like as I'm doing all these things, people are like, oh, you're doing this, you're doing that, and I was like, they're like, how do you feel? I was like, I don't think. I'm not always sure I'm the right one to be doing this. They're like, they picked you because you're qualified. I was like, do they know? <laughs> do they know who they picked? And then someone told me, and I think this is going to be how I handle imposter syndrome from now on is you'll always feel like an imposter because you know there's more to learn. So it's the minute you don't feel like an imposter, there's no more room for you to grow. So you maxed out and what's life at that point so there's always a part of you that's going to feel imposter syndrome because you acknowledge you don't have it all together and you need to get okay with that and so that's how I'm going to handle my imposter syndrome from now on be like yeah I don't have it all together but I have enough that someone thinks there's value in this but I will also know that there's room for me to continue to learn more and grow more so imposter syndrome is okay it's the making it syndrome that I have (laughs) (laughs) but I I think like this is our first time we've had a small chat on the phone before a couple emails back and forth but I think people pick up on your your personality your vibe um your spirit that that piece of um really connecting and being genuine like that's that's what comes across to me as a person And, and it's to me it's endearing um like all those things and you can tell when people are genuine and when they're not and and I would see why people would want you to do be a part of projects and all those things for that reason but um you know that whole struggle of should I can I will I (laughs) that that whole piece is is definitely real to to you and, and and to to people in general any words of wisdom to people who want to become entrepreneurs people who want to be want to do better people who want to learn more women black women let's let's talk maybe black women living here in newfoundland and labrador um just like what are your thoughts around that i think the goal should not be perfection because we live in a world where we're sold the idea that if it's not perfect it's not good enough so for when i when i'm talking to black women i'm going to say you're enough you're enough as you are because you are so if you want to try something you don't need to be perfect at it you don't need to be the best there ever was you just need to be you because there is enough value in you and then when I'm talking to people who are trying to be allies and advocates for those who are marginalized once again perfection is not the goal nothing in our life is perfect but if you do something, you're creating a better situation. So don't strive for perfection, strive for better. Better than last year, better than last month, better than yesterday, better than 10 minutes ago. So as long as you're striving for better, it means we're all pushing forward for something. So for Black women, you're enough in just being you, whether that is in owning who you are in a professional sense, in owning your experiences in your workplace. You're enough when it comes to your image and your beauty, because as black women, there is a lot of a battle that we do in finding ourselves beautiful in a world that paints us as either just an exotic erotic thing and not finding the beauty in our femininity and however it shows up for us. So to remind black women that you are enough in every sense and wherever you show up and however you show up, it is enough. It is beautiful and it is worthy. To our allies, for racialized folks and marginalized folks, don't strive to be perfect, just strive to be better. Better in any sense that you can control. And then for my cisgender white men who are out there who are hopefully listening and watching this, it's acknowledging that just giving people a seat at the table is not enough because then that tokenizes them, but giving them a voice a microphone and the space to show up as authentically as they are and understanding that lived experience counts for something. It might not be a degree, it might not be more letters behind their name, but their experience is worthy, it is valid and deserves a right to be there. That's what I tell people. Yes, 
I, I can't tell you, it, it's like you and I are kindred spirits and have met before because just it speaks to me so much. It's, I just love that. It's amazing. And I think when people try to do better, I think when people to listen to this podcast, they'll get a genuine sense of how they can do better. Just one or take one or two steps away, educate yourself, speak up, speak out, you know, exactly. become allies. You're not an ally because you say you're an ally. You're an ally because someone in a historically excluded community, underrepresented community says, hey, you are an ally because you did these things. Exactly. So, you know, this is, you know, you know, so much truth to be said and explored. I, I think one, I read a quote the other day from Regina George, actually, and she, no, Regina Jackson. And she was saying, I don't want allies. I want associates. So ally means you're doing it somewhere else. But I want you in the dirt, in the mud with me. I want you fighting on the same level as I am because the marginalized people have fought for a lot of the time themselves. It's now time to hand the weight to someone else to carry for a little bit so that we have time to rest up. We have time to formulate, there's time to strategize and know that you guys are in a position that you can handle the weight. You can handle the hard conversations. You can handle the uncomfortableness and you can handle the side eye from people who you love and care about being like, why is this important to you? Because if you don't handle it, nothing else is going to change. We can't. We've been carrying it for hundreds, thousands of years. It hasn't We've moved ourselves forward, but we still hit this battle of those in power don't value us. So step off. Um, what is it? So what I would want to say is people think there's a lot of like, people are coming to take things away from me. When you've had something for so long, you think it's a right. And then when someone else gets it, you think you're losing something. You don't have anything. The world is just slowly moving into it where everyone is given their own share. And for a lot of people in power, whether they be white, cisgender, male, whether they be of any makeup, that's a very scary thing to lose something that you thought was yours. But what I would gently remind them is it was never yours. You took it. And the people who have a rightful chance at that level of equity are coming back for it so hand it over gracefully and we'll all be happier for it no like you know the whole equity and i think people get equity and equality mixed up treat everyone the same no, no. do not treat everyone the same because every single person needs something different from you as a boss as an inclusive leader as a person we, we need to treat people as they'd want to be treated and exactly. people need different supports, different mechanisms. They need to have different conversations, different stimulations. You know, you know, we talk about culture fit versus culture add, two completely different things. Like don't pick people who are going to fit into your culture so everyone has a group think, right? Yes. Add people who add to your, your community, to your culture, of different backgrounds of diversities. Like, you know, add people to your to your workplaces that look different, think different, are different. Like yeah. I think that's fabulous when companies are. Uh, I don't agree with, you know, targets per se, but intentional hires we yes. look across the table and say, hey, we're missing these voices from our community. Like, you know, we don't have them. We, we want to hire people for this lived experience, for this background and this knowledge that they have. What are your exactly. thoughts on some of those things? I think those are essential. When we look at a business standpoint and people think, oh, I want to have a successful organization. I think it's important to make sure there are people at the table who come from a different walk of life than you do, especially if you're working, regard, actually regardless of the industry you're working mm -hmm. in, you want a proper representation of the community in which you find yourselves in. So if they are racialized people in your community, regardless of the proportion, make sure there's a racialized person at your table. Mm -hmm. If there are women in your community, make sure that there are women at the table. If there are trans people in your community, make sure that there are trans people at the table. But don't just give them a seat. Mm -hmm. Give them the space, the time to talk and share and value their contributions. And don't just take it as tokens. Because for people to show up in these spaces where they know they are minorities or marginalized, it takes a lot of bravery and it takes a lot of strength. And you need to value that. You need to reward it and you need to encourage it. Because when that happens, your organization truly gets a sense of those it serves and those who buy into it. And I think that's essential. Absolutely. So we're coming to the end of our podcast. It has been very oh rich and it's the time has flown by. Any last thoughts that you'd like to bring to our listening audience? 
I want to thank them for taking the time to listen, to tune in, because this isn't always an easy conversation to have. It isn't always easy to talk about things that point out that you aren't perfect. No one likes to be yeah. made to see that we aren't perfect, but I think it's important and it's for a better today, a better tomorrow and a better future. So when I look at it on the Newfoundland and Labrador sense, everyone who is here cares about this province. They care about it in ways that not everyone here understands, but no, no one is here because they have to be in a sense their choices. Everyone can leave if given the ability, but those who choose to stay truly want to make this their home. They feel attached to here. Value that attachment. No one is here to make take away from the culture of Newfoundland and Labrador. They're here because they love the culture that you have. They're just asking that you incorporate theirs too. You celebrate them in all their authenticness. So like when people think, oh, it's a melting pot. No, I do not want a melting pot. I want a charcuterie board where there's a little <laughs> bit of everything. And you know, like, oh, that cheese tastes great with that cracker or that thing dipped in chocolate is fantastic. You're not trying to make a soup. You're trying to enjoy a charcuterie board. And that's what I hope people take from it. Absolutely. I love that so much. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's amazing. Thank you so much for being on Be the Change podcast by Diversity NL. And thanks so much. It's been a pleasure to get to know you a little bit more and to get to chat with you. And hopefully we'll chat again soon. We absolutely will. Thank you so much for including me in this. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much.